This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Near Albany, New York, an elderly couple was brutally murdered in their own home. Incredibly, police solved the case only after they enlisted the help of a psychic named Noreen Rainier. Does Noreen have remarkable powers that enable her to actually experience a crime from the victim's point of view? Tonight, you'll see this unique detective in action. Imagine that you wake up one day in a park in New Orleans, unable to remember your name, your age, or where you came from. Well, how did it feel to not know who you are? That's horrible. You don't expect things like that to happen to you. She goes by the name Gigi. No one knows what made her forget, but perhaps someone watching can help her remember. Alfredo and Cecilia Newball seemed the perfect couple with a perfect life, until the night Alfredo came home from work and made the sobering discovery that his wife had vanished. Did she leave her husband for another man, or was she the victim of foul play? Also tonight, the poignant drama of a man who needs your help to uncover his late father's secret life. Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. We are in a police evidence warehouse in Los Angeles. An unorthodox murder investigation is in progress. What you are watching is real. It is not a recreation. Relax, breathe. Take a breath. He hurt me. In the argument, he hurt you? <laughs> Earlier. Noreen Rainier is a psychic from Orlando, Florida, who works with the police. Among the psychics we have profiled, she is unique, a true unsolved mystery. Noreen Rainier claims that she actually becomes one with the victims. She feels their pain, speaks their words, and sees the faces of their killers. It can be a daunting, painful, and exhausting way to make a living. However, the rewards for everyone involved are usually substantial. To date, Noreen has worked with the police in 32 different states and four foreign countries on some 385 different crimes. Perhaps Noreen's most stunning success was a case involving the deaths of Jake and Dora Cohn, an elderly couple from Colony, New York, a suburb of Albany. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. You know what I did today? At 9.50 p.m. on May 15th, 1986, Dora was on the phone with a couple's only daughter who lived nearby. Yeah. Hey, listen, how about dinner Friday night? <laughs> yeah, I've been making some new recipes. So I tried In an instant, today. tragedy struck. Yeah, well, anytime's fine. How about... Jake! Mom? Jake! Dora screamed out her husband's name twice. Mom, her daughter me? immediately called 911. Then she telephoned her son, James Mariani, and rushed to meet him at her parents' house. James, Mom, James, they're not telling me anything and they're not letting me in. Mom! Ma'am, ma'am, I'm, I'm sorry. What's going on in there? I'm what's sorry. What's going on? What's going on? My parents are in there. Ma'am, listen Something's to me. Something's wrong. Listen to me. I hate to tell you this, but they've been killed. <gasps> I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. The elderly female was lying on the floor with the phone still in her hand. It appeared that she had fallen over while on the telephone. 
Uh, she was shot in the top of the head on a right to left angle. Uh, the male victim was on the floor in a hallway. He appeared to be shot in the nose. The only evidence that we found was the entranceway door had been kicked in. Part of the, the door stopper was laying on the kitchen floor, and it was two empty shells uh, also laying on the floor. When James Mariani knew at a glance that the shells were 25 caliber, he became a suspect in his grandparents' murder. Are you the grandson? The police asked him to take a lie detector test, yes. even though they knew he had been at his own home when the murders occurred. Did you shoot Jake and Dora? No. The test results were inconclusive, and the police remained suspicious. Did you help James had a criminal record and friends with criminal records. I was with uh, just a couple friends, Larry, Larry and JJ. The yeah. police yeah, interviewed two name. men James Larry had done jail time with, JJ Keith no, Snare no, and Robert five. Skinner. You were, you were Both together, had know. alibis. No? This is my what, girlfriend. What's, what's her name? Sandy. The investigation eventually bogged down. Two years went by. Then Jake and Dora's daughter heard about Noreen Rainier and asked the police to contact her. Noreen knew absolutely nothing about the case, except the names and ages of the victims. Noreen, I sent you some articles that were present at the crime scene. It was November of 1988. Noreen worked long distance by speakerphone. I'm going to start with the glasses. I'm going to start with Dora. I'm going to try to tune in and see what she saw just before she was killed. Well, Jake doesn't have to bone that night. We'd love to come. When she was Dora, uh, she described how she was on a telephone with a female. Uh, she hears a crashing sound. Wonderful recipe for that. Oh, Jake! Jake! Noreen called out Jake's name twice, just as Dora had before she was shot. As she's Jake, she describes how she gets up off the couch, Jake! goes down a narrow hallway, and she's confronted with someone with a gun. I know you. What the hell are you doing here? Noreen remembers as she felt pain in the center of her face, just where Jake had been shot. My face, I'm shot in my face. She had given a pretty accurate description of both Jake and Dora, and a fairly accurate description of the crime scene. Uh, this made me take notice and, and, and feel that she was credible in what she was doing. I'm going to count from five to zero. As I count, your eyes will become heavier. And heavier. The police were beginning to feel that Noreen might be able to help them crack the case. They asked her to work with a forensic hypnotist. One and zero. Now going back, back in time to May 15th, 1986. Dora, tell me about the intruder. We knew him. He was a younger man. What are you with doing? Brown hair. And he came Bless to our show. house Jake. for dinner. He did some George, work for happened? my husband. I know you. What are you doing in here? I'm not playing, old man. Where's the money? What do you want? Where's the money? What are you talking about? Where is the money? Where are you? to tell me his name. Focus, perhaps we'll take a letter at a time. Do you see a letter? S. Okay, do you see another letter? Following the hypnosis session, we presented Noreen with a series of 10 photographs. photographs we had put uh, three of them in there who we felt were the suspects, suspects at this time. The last couple of years. So like oh, no, I, I, I don't want to see them. Why don't you just lay them face down and let me pick up the energies from them? 
Okay. Noreen took the photographs. Matter of fact, her eyes were closed and uh, and just shuffled through the photographs, held them for a while, held each one, and then kept placing one, two, three photographs down. I feel the strongest energy from these three photographs. And this one in particular, he might have been the one that killed Che Gondora. The man in the first photo had nothing at all to do with the case. But the second photo was Robert Skinner, the friend of Jake and Dora's grandson, James Mariani. The third photo was Mariani himself. It was not lost on the police that Robert Skinner's last name began with S, the one letter Noreen had visualized. Where were you? This is my girlfriend. What's, what's her name? Sandy. Armed with Noreen's information, the police checked Robert Skinner's alibi again. It did not hold up. Eventually, the DA proved that James Mariani had conspired with Robert Skinner and Keith Snare to rob his grandparents. All three men are now serving lengthy prison sentences. Noreen Rainier had proved vital in solving the case. When the skeptics ask me, how does it work, my answer usually is, you've been using your logical, rational mind for many years. Explain to me how it works. How does your memory, how do you learn math? How does a brain work when you spell? You don't know, and neither do I, but you can use your mind, and so can I. If she can help me, I would welcome anything she can give me. Detective Jim Tiampo of the LAPD is currently working with Noreen on the case of 42-year-old Rosemary Hom, co-owner of a Chinese bakery near downtown Los Angeles. She was kidnapped and stabbed to death on November 5th, 1994. The last person to see Rosemary alive was one of her employees. Just before 9 a.m., he noticed her van approaching the bakery. Rosemary slowed down and waited on her way into the parking garage across the street. The employee next observed that an Asian man got out of a parked car and entered the garage just after Rosemary drove in. He waited for about a half hour. She never showed. He uh, didn't hear anything. There wasn't anything suspicious. But after a half hour of waiting, he noticed the garage door come up again. And at this time, he saw Mrs. Hong's car coming out of the garage, but it was the male Asian driving the car. Mrs. Hong was nowhere in sight. 11 hours later, Rosemary Hom's van was found. Rosemary was lying dead on the back seat. Although Noreen Rainier usually works by phone, for this case, Unsolved Mysteries brought her to Los Angeles. With Rosemary Hom's van parked behind her and Rosemary's watch in her hand, Noreen seemed to become the victim. Yeah, uh, I'm Rosemary. My eyes are just slightly uh, close set, a little close setness in the eyes. Uh, there was some oval shaped uh, face for the police to make sure that my credibility becomes strong. I describe what the victim looked like. Before we start the case, I don't know anything about it, so they have no way of thinking I checked on who this person was. I describe the person, what he looked like or she looked like alive, and then I become killed. Stay with it, stay with it. Just a little longer, stay with it. Remember, what you are seeing is not a recreation. Why is he mad at you? Why is she doing this to you, Rosemary? He's jealous. He's jealous. He's jealous. Oh, What's I'm he jealous just of? My knees my neck. Okay. He ain't wanted to live. I don't want to do this. Okay, okay. Well, I hate you. Right. Oh, my neck. My... Come back. Okay. Rosemary suffered, you know, countless wounds. The point is that she focused in on the one wound that really caused her death, and it was extremely painful to her. Uh, that surprised me because that hasn't been in any report. It hasn't been in any news articles. It hasn't been on any press releases. It, it would have very uh, few lines, but the lines would be very significant. She talked about tattoos, marks on the, on the person that uh, we're looking at. It's not, we're not just being very complicated. The tattoo she described is indicative of a group uh, 
a gang, I guess you might say, uh, that we have chartered for several years. Uh, my face is more broad. I have a police artist that I work with, and I see the bad guy, and he draws the bad guy. If the victim saw the bad guy, I can see how the victim saw him. If for some reason the victim got shot in the back or was asleep when they were killed, I can go there and observe as Noreen what he's doing and what's going on. So I can be several, the victim, the, the suspect, and Noreen can pop in and out. I found the most impressive thing about Noreen was going into it not knowing anything about the crime. She was able to describe to me the crime scene, describe to me where the body was found. She identified a spot as a dump site. No one knows about that except us. So we're going to look at everything she says, you know, with, with a, a great deal of credibility. This is the full face composite that Noreen visualized for the police artist. This is a profile view composite based on the description given by the employee who last saw Rosemary Hom alive. Next, a husband becomes a potential suspect when his wife and stepson mysteriously disappear. She was beautiful, a devoted mother, by all accounts madly in love with her husband, and now she is missing. Seven months ago, Cecilia Newball mysteriously vanished, along with her six-year-old son. At the time, Cecilia was eight and a half months pregnant. Today, her husband, Alfredo Newball, lives under a cloud of suspicion. He says he had no involvement in his wife's disappearance, and in fact, he claims to have an airtight alibi. But both the police and Cecilia's friends think Alfredo knows more than he is admitting. Alfredo Newball and Cecilia Maya met in 1991. After a passionate two-year courtship, they married. At the ceremony, Cecilia's son from a previous marriage, Rene Perez, was the ring bearer. The couple settled in Chatsworth, California, and almost immediately, Cecilia became pregnant. By September 20th, 1994, Cecilia's due date was only two weeks away. That afternoon, she sat down to write thank you notes for a recent baby shower. Yes. What was your uncle's George girlfriend name, babe? At around 2.30 p.m., Alfredo left for work. As he reached the front door, Alfredo says he was stopped short by a strange, undefined yearning. Being pregnant, she looks so beautiful. And I went back and, and kissed her again. I love you. I left her sitting at the, inside the apartment writing the thank you notes. And that was the last time that I saw my wife. Alfredo worked as a nurse's assistant in a hospital and retirement home for members of the film industry. Two and a half hours after his shift began, Alfredo phoned Cecilia. I just had some kind of very weird feeling that uh, something was wrong. She never answered the phone. <clears throat> and I don't know, for some reason, I thought uh, that she could be visiting with some friends or being at my mom's. Alfredo called several times throughout the evening. Finally, fearing the worst, he left work early. Even as he approached the apartment, Alfredo knew that something was not quite right. Cecilia's Jeep was parked on the street instead of in the building's security lot. Cecilia? 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 Inside the apartment, Alfredo says nothing was out of Cecilia? place. There were no signs of a struggle or break-in, and Cecilia? no signs of Cecilia and Renee. But in Cecilia's Jeep, 
Alfredo found a sentimental generic goodbye card. It was signed simply, Cecilia. A moment later, Alfredo's concern turned to bewilderment. Cecilia's wedding and engagement rings had been left on the passenger seat of the Jeep. To Alfredo, the conclusion was obvious. His wife must have left him. The relationship uh, was always good. We never had any problems, fights. Why would she do something like this? Not to leave me a note like that and, and I had to leave the wedding rings. I, yes, it was very confusing to me. Desperate for answers, Alfredo phoned the one person he thought might know his wife's whereabouts, her closest friend at work, Kevin Annabelle. It was this phone call that would help cast suspicion on Alfredo Newball. Hello? Kevin, this is Al. Yeah, what time is it? I don't know, it's about midnight. Is Cece there? What? No, Cece's not here. What's going on? I don't know, I mean, she's gotta be there. Put her on. I came home, she's not here. And I was I'm like, about it. you know, Al, she's Cece's not here, and you're, you're really starting to scare me. What's going on? and he was unusually calm. Like, if it were me, I would have been screaming at the person I thought where my wife was. But he was, I was more um, nervous and excited than he was. I felt like she needed to be away for a few days or something, I don't know. It was very strange, but uh, like I believe that she was coming back soon. It appeared that nothing was taken uh, by Cecilia or her son, Rene. All his toys were left there, clothing was left there, not so much as a toothbrush. Hello, is this Alfredo Newball? The day after Cecilia disappeared, the police called Alfredo. They had been contacted by one of Cecilia's relatives. Uh, can you tell me, Mr. Newball, when was the last time you saw our wife, Cecilia? Uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, I was getting ready to go to work, uh, then I gave her a kiss and that was it. Mr. Newball didn't appear to be that concerned. And here he has a eight and a half month pregnant wife, a six year old stepson that according to everyone, including Mr. Newball, uh, they all got along fine. Uh, what you got to Mr. Newball here, just you didn't careful. appear to be the uh, grieving times, husband, soon to be new father. The suspicions mounted three days later when Alfredo received a letter postmarked in nearby Van Nuys, California. Inside the envelope was a card identical to the one found in the Jeep and a typewritten note. Alfredo, I have gone to Honduras with a man I met nine months ago by the name of Arturo. He's a doctor. I don't know if this baby is yours or his. I love you with all my heart, but you will not amount to anything and I want only the best for my baby. Alfredo, you can't give us that. Adios, Cecilia and Rene. My first impression after opening the letter was that uh, she had left, but then after reviewing the letter several times, uh, some parts, it don't sound like Cecilia. It doesn't strike me as, as a Cecilia at all. It, it's common. Kevin Annabelle I mean, also no found the letter out of character. So was, I would say she was almost obsessed with Al. And when you're, when you're that in love with a person, you don't just meet a doctor and say, well, I think I'm going to Honduras. Let me just write my husband a note. That doesn't happen. I took a look at the letter, spoke to friends and family of Cecilia later on, and uh, I'm convinced that that letter is not from Cecilia. Whoever typed this letter knew more about Alfredo's side of the family rather than knowing very much about Cecilia's side of the family. My best guess on this is that Cecilia, Cecilia's disappearance is not by her will. Uh, I believe there's a third party involved in this. Cecilia speaking. Was there a third party? And if so, was there a connection to Alfredo? Six months before she disappeared, Cecilia received a phone call from a still unidentified woman who may have been that third party. What? She had gotten a call that a woman had a videotape of Al 
kissing another woman at a baby shower and that the woman wanted Cecilia to see the tape and Cecilia had agreed to see the tape. Okay, yes, I know what's that. Eight o'clock? The woman said she would phone again to arrange a meeting. That okay, call never fine. came and the matter was apparently forgotten. Then, just a few weeks before Cecilia disappeared, a Hello? second mysterious call. Yes, this is this Cecilia. one from a woman who claimed to be a co-worker of Alfredo's. Oh, Tessie? From? Oh, you work with Alfredo. A woman had called and, and oh, said that nice she was giving Al, you. they were gonna give Al a baby shower at work and that she had some uh, baby furniture and she wanted Cecilia to pick out a piece of that furniture but to keep it a secret because the shower was gonna be a surprise. On the 20th? Yeah, that's fine. Police later determined that the call had not been made by Alfredo's coworker and that no shower had been okay, planned. But by then, it was too Thank late. Thank you very much. Bye. She disappeared on Tuesday, the day she was supposed to get together with this lady to pick out a piece of furniture for the baby shower. Too much of a coincidence for her to disappear on the same day. It appears that someone is trying to lure her away from safety, away from her family, away from her friends, trying to get her alone. If she's somewhere, she doesn't want to come back to me. But I still just want to know what happened to them. And that's what I, I really need the, the public's help finding something about this case. It's my opinion that uh, Mr. Newball is not telling me everything that he knows. Uh, as far as Cecilia's disappearance, he may not have been there when she disappeared, but it's my opinion that he knows something now. What happened to Cecilia Newball and her son, Rene Perez? Were they abducted and perhaps murdered? Or did Cecilia run away to be with another man? If Cecilia is alive, as Alfredo believes, she is now the mother of their seven-month-old child, and Alfredo is concerned both for her and the baby. I wanna tell Cecilia, if, if she happens to view this, please uh, get in touch. If she doesn't wanna write me or talk to me on the phone to at least call her dad, you know, he's like he's not well, and I just want to tell you that there's a lot of people suffering right now, and still because of this. In a moment, the strange case of a young woman suffering from amnesia. Perhaps someone watching knows her true identity. Imagine suddenly finding yourself in a strange and alien place. You scan your surroundings for clues. Even your own possessions are unrecognizable. Finally, the terrifying realization. You don't know where you are. You don't know who you are. You're suffering from amnesia. That's horrible. And it's, it's so sudden, like, you're not prepared for it. You don't expect things like that to happen to you. I didn't, like, I didn't know what to do. I knew I had to go get help somewhere. The mystery woman of Audubon Park had the vague notion that her name might be Gigi. Other than that, she knew nothing of her past. Tonight, she is still asking herself the one fundamental question we all take for granted. Who am I? To help Gigi find the answer, we turn now to reporter Susan Rosgen of NBC affiliate WDSU-TV, New Orleans. I met with Gigi in Audubon Park, where her peculiar odyssey began six months ago. 
Gigi struck me as articulate and well-educated. What's it like to not have any past? What is it like to be a person living without a past and not knowing how you got here? It's strange. I feel like I have a blank on my head and nothing to base anything on. So I have to just go by day, day by day, what I realize day by day. Gigi, these are the things that you had when you woke up here at Audubon Park. Did you recognize them right away as your things? No, I just assumed they were mine because they were with, with me. There wasn't anyone else close to me, so I just assumed they were mine. And since I couldn't had... help puzzling over the odd assortment of belongings that sum up Gigi's life. Not really. Laid out for display, they painted a disjointed picture. Four pairs of scissors, a gold-plated table setting, UPS notices that only company personnel should have, and deposit envelopes specific to banks in the Northeastern United States. And finally, there was the makeup. Gigi was carrying no less than 26 tubes of lipstick, 24 lip liner pencils, and dozens of other cosmetics. Presumably, some of these things are clues to Gigi's real identity, but so far, they haven't helped a bit. To date, police have reviewed hundreds of missing persons files. Doctors have probed and tested. Even sodium amytal, a so-called truth serum, couldn't pierce the fog of Gigi's amnesia. Now, a hospital official named Doyle McGee has voluntarily assumed the job of uncovering Gigi's past. Which is totally confusing. Do you believe that Gigi sincerely does not remember her past? I do. She um, has made a conscious effort to assist me on every phase of trying to find out who she is through the law enforcement agencies, through the media. Um, if she was in fact trying to conceal her identity, she would not have signed the releases that allow us to do this. Doyle McGee is especially mystified by the total absence of anything personal in Gigi's wallet or handbag. He fears that this omission is no accident. Somebody has gone to great pains to make sure that we don't know who she is. The wallets are fairly new. They had absolutely nothing personal in them. No personal photos, no credit cards, no checks. Purse had no receipts and, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know of any lady who didn't accidentally drop a receipt or something in her purse. What could have triggered Gigi's amnesia? Experts believe she may have seen or experienced something so horrible that in defense, her memory simply shut down. If someone watching helps you find out who you were, are you a little afraid to find out who you were? I want to know, even then. Because it's, it's been so long that I, you know, not knowing that it doesn't match me with a scooter bag. I just want to know. What do the terms past, present, and future mean to you now? Well, the past is, to me, is the past unknown. The present is just day-to-day -day life here, and the future is very uncertain for me now, at this point. Gigi has been trapped in the limbo of amnesia since February 1995. With luck, she will soon discover her true identity. Otherwise, she has no choice but to close the door on her past, assemble a new legal identity, and begin her life again from scratch. Next, a man needs your help to find the truth about his father's mysterious past. It is a sorrowful event that we must all face someday, the death of a parent. For an 11-year-old boy named Bob Coleman, it was a time to reflect on everything he had ever known about his father or at least everything his father had wanted him to know. 
By all accounts, Richard Coleman was an ordinary man who lived a fairly uneventful life. Richard worked as a vending machine mechanic in Washington, D.C. He had served in the military and married in 1947. Bob was born two years later, and today, Bob's strongest memory of childhood is a love of baseball he shared with his father. He had a passion to play ball, and um, we'd go out to the yard, the side yard and the front yard, and he'd pitch the ball to me, and I'd hit it, and it was something that I enjoyed an awful lot. And I loved being outside with him and um, playing ball whenever we could. Richard Coleman passed away in 1961. A short time later, Bob received the first hint that his father had been a man with many deeply held secrets. Curiosity drew Bob to an old trunk at the foot of his parents' bed. Inside was a tantalizing collection of his father's military mementos. What are you doing, Bobby? Just looking at Dad's old stuff. Was Dad in the Army? Yes, he was, but your dad didn't really like to talk about it, honey. He did something in the Army that he wasn't proud of. Why don't you just close it up? I remember many, many times asking my mom about my dad and specifically honing in on the items in the Foot Locker. And she didn't have too many explanations other than that she believed that my dad had done something he wasn't real proud of and that his words were, it's over and done with. 14 years passed. Finally, in 1975, Bob's own experiences in the military drew him back to the forbidden contents of the trunk. Bob was flooded with emotion as he once again held the uniform which had so fascinated him as a child. It had the uh, silver bars of a first lieutenant still on it. It had the uh, insignia, interestingly enough, of a uh, medical corps, a uh, plain caduceus, which would indicate that the person who wore that uniform was a uh, medical doctor in the Army. Was it possible that Richard Coleman, vending machine mechanic, had been a doctor in the Army? For Bob, the very possibility triggered a vivid childhood memory. My mom had cut her hand open very, very badly, and there was a lot of blood. She was bleeding profusely. Bobby, Sharon, come in here, please. And I remember my dad taking control of the situation, sizing up the, um, the emergency. He applied the pressure to the, to the cut and actually knew about pressure points and, and did something that I don't remember because I was small, but he did something that he actually was able to stop the bleeding pretty quickly. And he took control of the situation in a way that would lead me to believe that he knew more about um, the medical field than somebody who was not trained. a boy. See, everything is fine. Why would Richard Coleman abandon medicine to become a vending machine mechanic? Bob could no longer ignore the fact that his father was not the man he thought he knew. The trunk yielded other perplexing clues. Though the uniform was from the Second World War, Bob discovered several prestigious medals from the First World War, almost 30 years earlier. The awards included a Legion of Honor ribbon and a Croix de Guerre, the French Cross of War. Another item from the First World War raised still more questions. It was a World War I certificate. And as I looked at it, I remember uh, noticing that items had been written over. Someone had gone back after it was issued and put my father's name, Richard Coleman, and, his, and a service number and other information were written over the original inscriptions. The same envelope which contained the certificate held a piece of paper which appeared to be a crib sheet on it, Richard Coleman had practiced writing the same words and numbers that had been forged on the certificate. Bob checked with the Veterans Administration. He wasn't really surprised to learn that the discharge certificate had belonged to another man. 
But a second discovery left Bob truly stunned. There was no record of a Richard Coleman ever having served in the Army Medical Corps, either in the First or Second World War. That's his room right there. The sudden developments once again thrust Bob back to his childhood and the final days of his father's life. Hi, Sharon. Hi, honey. Hi, glad to see you. How are you feeling today? I feel a little better. Good. Has anybody came to visit you? No, you're the first one. What about your brothers and sisters and your family? Shh, shh. We're daddy's family, honey. We sure are. I remember asking several times, well, my dad's sick. He's probably going to pass away. Where's his family? And why hasn't anyone appeared to see how he is or, you know, to visit him? What a beautiful dress you have. And my mom really wouldn't answer it. She didn't have an answer, I guess. And I never, I never got any uh, satisfactory explanation for that. Who was Richard Coleman? And just what secrets was he hiding? The trunk held one other important clue, a roster supplement from a New York City gun club. It listed Richard as a member in 1944 and gave his occupation special patrolman. From tax records, Bob learned that his father had been employed as a security guard at a bank in Manhattan from 1943 to 1945. However, the bank had no employment records for a Richard Coleman. When Bob researched his father's address from 1944, he had another startling detail surfaced. My father may have lived with an Alice Coleman, and I don't know what her um, maiden name was, but voting records indicate that they were married and that she was a housewife and that she lived with Richard Coleman. I've never been able to uh, confirm their marriage because there's no record that I can find, and indeed I don't know where Alice Coleman um, went to, because after 1967, she does not appear in the, Met, in the uh, Manhattan phone books. Was there something in Richard Coleman's past that made him change his identity? Why did he keep his apparent marriage to Alice Coleman secret? And why, despite a trunk filled with mementos, did the military have no record of his serving in either world war? Bob's mother passed away in 1983 without giving him any clues. Today, Bob Coleman is determined to find the answers, whatever they may be. I'm not trying to judge my father. I'm trying to learn about him, and I'm perfectly um, aware that there may be something that he did 50, 60 years ago that was um, pretty bad, perhaps, and it would have uh, prompted him to change his identity and to obscure his past. But it's also something that's very important to me because it's my father, and it may be the only way that I uh, ultimately end up really knowing who he was and what he did, and I'm very passionate and very committed to doing that. Can faith work hand in hand with modern medicine? On our next Unsolved Mysteries, we'll bring you the inspirational stories of a woman and a young boy who battled serious illnesses and fully recovered. Some believe that the power of prayer helps save their lives. Join me next time for another intriguing edition of Unsolved Mysteries.